Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Monday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. I just have to say, I'm really glad to be with you. This last weekend, and by the way, you know, I, I normally film on Sunday mornings. I try to film my Monday through Wednesday videos, kind of get it out of the way so I can concentrate on my research and my writing. <clears throat> well, yesterday, I was unable to film because we had no power here in the Ardmore area. What happened is, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, we had a massive, massive storm system come through on Saturday night. Within 30 miles of where I'm sitting right now, we had no less than five major tornadoes. Now, you can see a report on this on Fox News. I was looking at it just this morning. Uh, one of the towns, it's a town that I go through very, very commonly, uh, very quaint little community called Sulphur, Oklahoma. They have there a, um, a, a very historic downtown area, some beautiful, beautiful old buildings. Uh, I said they have, they had, uh, that city got leveled. Well, I should say a good part of the city got leveled. Uh, so many of the wonderfully, wonderful architectural works from many, many years ago are simply not there or they're completely leveled. It's really, really tragic. At Marietta, which is just south of me, uh, approximately 20 miles, something like that, it got to hospital. Thankfully, they had moved all of the patients to the, to the basement. No one was injured there. However, there's a massive, massive warehouse distribution center down there uh, for Dollar Tree, which is a major uh, store chain. Uh, it's difficult to imagine how large that building is. Well, it no longer has a roof of any kind. And I mean, the entire inventory was then exposed to, <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, the, the weather service, the local weather service says we got an inch and a half, maybe, of rain. Well, I had a, a blue tub in the back of my pickup during the storm. Had a bunch of parts in it, unfortunately. But I had a lid partially on it, right? It had a full 12 inches of water in the tub. Thankfully, I'll be able to salvage the parts with WD-40 and what have you, but nonetheless... So they're telling us officially we had an inch and a half rain and in that tub I had one foot of water. To the east of us, a town called Medill, they also had significant damage. So you kind of get the idea. My wife and I have a, uh, a safe room. It was, it was built to withstand 200 mile an hour uh, winds. Uh, its walls are eight to 10 inches thick, has three quarter inch rebar in it, and it's on the interior of our house. Well, we were in there three different times during the night because the storms got so severe. They were blowing the, the sirens immediately south of me, uh, probably seven or eight miles. Uh, there's a racetrack down there, a dirt track racetrack down there. I do not know if it hit it, but they said that it was headed directly toward it. And that means it was headed directly toward us because anything that comes from that direction normally hits us. So <coughs> as you can tell, yesterday was quite a day. Again, power was completely out. Uh, the, the power company initially issued a statement via text and Facebook and what have you, that said our power would be out, hope, quote, hopefully no more than three days. And we're going, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. We're all electric here. <laughs> so the idea of being without electricity for three days, thankfully we had water, but wow. But yesterday afternoon, kind of mid-afternoon, a little bit later, 
uh, the power suddenly came on. So, yeah, like I said, it was an exciting, terrifying day. Tragically, in the tornadoes, they now they know, now know of five individuals, including a four-month-old baby that was killed in the storm. So, very, very tragic. It, it's uh, it's one of the one of the sad realities of living in southern Oklahoma, where I'm at, is considered and immediately north of is is considered tornado alley. Very, very common for them to come up through here. So I'm glad to be with you this morning. I'm glad we didn't have to test out our safe room to see if it would withstand a direct hit. I'm feeling awfully sad for the people that have suffered such horrendous loss. Uh, I don't know the exact number of homes that were destroyed, but you see images of farm areas in which there are no there are no buildings left standing at all, and it makes you ha- ha- makes you wonder how many cattle were killed, horses, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's it's very uh, <clears throat> it's a very dangerous time, Southern Oklahoma, and we're just now getting into the tornado season. So probably we have a good bit of more good bit more of excitement if you want to call it that, (laughs) Uh, to be looking forward to in this upcoming storm season. So there's your local weather report, your local report from Southern Oklahoma as to what happened over the weekend. Once again, glad to be making it through, glad to be okay, just uh, uh, definitely not eagerly anticipating a repeat of that, but it is what it is. So let's get back into our study. We are examining the feast days of Israel. We've been focused on Colossians chapter 2, 14 to 17, where it says that Christ nailed the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, contrary to us, nailing them to the cross. And I've, I've been examining how this passage has served for, well, over a century, for one of the mo- one of the most foundational passages by Sabbatarians to draw a distinction between the seventh day Sabbath and grammatically it's not permissible, but nonetheless, between the seventh day Sabbath and the quote ceremonial Sabbaths. So the argument has been and continues to be that well when Paul said that Christ took out a, took the handwriting of ordinances out of the way, he was talking about the bloody animal sacrifices, the the sacrificial feast days. Now, that overlooks that the Sabbath was also a bloody sacrificial day. They offered two animal sacrifices every Sabbath. So anyway, the argument goes that God took out of the way all of the ceremonial aspects of the law but he left just the Sabbath. Now, it's more than convenient. I'm not trying to be snide or sarcastic, but it's more than convenient to say, well, he left the Sabbath when all of the sacrifices were an integral part of it. But that's what you have to do in order to get the Sabbath to remain. You have to, you have to say, well, the, the Sabbath day observance itself remains in effect, meaning no work, no labor, but the penalty for violation is taken out of the way. And the bloody animal sacrifices associated with it, according to Numbers chapter 30, those have been taken out of the way. <clears throat> I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that, that is an artificial and it's a specious argument. There's no, there's no justification for it. To make such a distinction between, you know, the sacrificial elements, quote, given by Moses versus the law of God is simply an artificial argument. And it was invented strictly to justify 
the continuing observance of the seventh-day Sabbath. But what I've been pointing out is that the argument that says, the argument it, itself that says, oh, well, what Colossians chapter 2 is talking about is that the ceremonial laws were taken out of the way, but not the Sabbath. That violates what Paul says. When he says, speaking of the new moons, the feast days, and the Sabbaths, he uses the plural form of the Sabbaths, which means it is an all-inclusive statement. He doesn't say most of the Sabbaths or some of the Sabbaths. He says Sabbaths, plural, which is an all-inclusive statement. But he said, let no man judge you in respect of new moons, feast days, and service, which are present active in the Greek, a shadow of the good things that are about to come from the Greek word mellow in the infinitive. And as I have pointed out to you, I have encouraged you to get on the internet and just look up Bill Mounts on mellow, Bill Mounts on the Greek. <clears throat> and if you can't find that link, I can certainly send it to you. But Bill Mounts, one of the most highly recognized Greek authorities in the world today, he says that, that the meaning of mellow in the infinitive means about to be, to be on the point of doing something. Now, he's certainly not a preterist. He has no bone to chew on, has, you know, doesn't have a special motive in saying that. He's just observing the meaning of the Greek. So I've been pointing out that since Paul refers to the new moons, the feast days, and the Sabbaths, which were when he wrote in 62 AD, still unfulfilled shadows of the things that were about to be fulfilled. They were about to come into reality, meaning they were still valid. They were still imposed, to use the terminology from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9 and 10. They were still binding when Paul wrote. Okay, we know this because, as I've shared with you, the apostle, in referring to those last three feast days specifically, and I, as I've already pointed out, I believe that an argument could be made that Pentecost was not itself completely fulfilled yet because it's the Feast of First Fruits and the First Fruits had not yet been gathered. Not all of them. Okay. So I just want to make, make that crystal clear once again. So here we have reference to new moons. Well, that's Rosh Hashanah. That's Yom Teruah. That's the Feast of Trumpet. And it signified the feast, or excuse me, it signified the Day of Judgment. So what I've point, been pointing out to you is that from Pentecost onward, the biblical narrative, uh, the epistolary evidence, is that from Pentecost forward, and you find it even in the book of Acts, they were looking for the coming of the judgment. And by the way, we even find this in Acts chapter 14, 22 and 23, where Paul, as his custom was, went through the churches, back through the churches that he had established, establishing them in the truth and reminding them, as, he, as it says, quote, that we, that's those first century churches, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom. Now listen to me, folks. Paul is simply reiterating the common Jewish eschatological narrative. In, in the Jewish narrative, the timeline, if you please, they believed that in the last days, Elijah would come. They believed in the last day, that in the last days, the great tribulation would occur, that then would lead directly into the resurrection and the coming of the Lord. <clears throat> so what's Paul saying? Well, here's what he's not saying. Paul is not saying, well, you know, when you become a Christian, you're just going to have to suffer a little bit. Now, is there a principle at work 
that would suggest that? Well, yes. Jesus said, I am come a light into the world. And men love darkness more than they love light. So yeah, there's an eternal principle at work right there. And we're seeing it play out in America, throughout everywhere, with the growing antagonism toward Christianity, toward Jesus, the light of the world. More and more and more courts are passing down decisions. You can't even have a Bible study in your own home, so says the courts in some communities. You certainly cannot have a Bible study in schools. Now, they might allow Islam groups to have their studies, but not Christians for crying out loud. You see the point I'm making? There is a principle that darkness hates light. Nothing is more light than the light of Jesus Christ. And thus they hate it, or eternal principle. But <clears throat> in Acts 14, 22 and 23, Paul is iterating that Jewish concept of eschatology and saying we must through great tribulation enter into the kingdom. Well, listen to me. In one of my newest books entitled, These are the Days when I, Which All Things Must Be Fulfilled, I document that throughout the Tanakh, throughout the Old Testament, what do we find? We find an inseparable, inseparable connection between the prediction of the coming great tribulation otherwise known as the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 35 and 6, and their coming resurrection. Folks, this is just good Jewish eschatology. It, it amuses me and saddens me both at times when I remind people that, that Jesus and his apostles simply taught the basic outline of Jewish eschatology coming of Elijah. Jesus said John the baptizer was Elijah. Matthew 7, pardon me, Matthew 17, oh, excuse me, 10 to 12, Elijah has already come. I wrote a book on this. That's Jewish eschatology. Elijah would come, the great tribulation would come, resurrection would take place throughout the Old Testament narrative. We have the predictions of the Great Tribulation followed immediately by prophecies of the resurrection, the coming of the Lord, the kingdom, the new creation, etc., etc. So Paul in Acts chapter 14, 22 and 23 was not saying anything different from what his basic Jewish education had taught him. And yet what I started to say, I very, very often uh, point out such things as this, and people say, oh, well, there's a bunch of un unbelieving Jews. That's just a bunch of unbelieving rabbis. I don't believe anything they said. Really? Well, they believed in the inspiration of Scripture. You don't, you don't, so you don't accept that because the Jewish people believe that? Uh, they believed in the coming of the Messiah. So because it was a bunch of unbelieving Jews who said Messiah was going to come, you don't believe that either? They believed that when Messiah came, the kingdom would come. So because the Jews believe that, you don't believe that. And they believed in the coming of the great tribulation. So because they're unbelieving Jews, you don't believe the great tribulation was supposed to happen? even though Jesus said it would happen in his generation, following the traditional Jewish guide time, timeline and narrative. Listen, folks, it's a specious argument. Has no probative value whatsoever to say, oh, well, you know, that's just a bunch of unbelieving Jews that believe those things, so I don't believe that. That's a counterproductive argument. So the point of it is, here is Paul in the book of Acts. And it, I got sidetracked here a little bit, didn't I? Uh, because I've already gone through James and Hebrews and 1 Peter. But it's good to see that 
here even in the book of Acts, you have the prediction of the coming of the great tribulation, this time of judgment. It was part of the Jewish narrative. Okay, tomorrow I'm going to show you how this concept of the about to be judgment following hard on Pentecost in a imminent context was being taught in the book of Jude. And then we'll go to Revelation. All right? Thanks for joining me. Don't forget the, the, you know, the two-book special. Save yourself 15 bucks. Go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. Get a copy of my book, Israel's Last Feast Days, you know, Resurrection Feast Fulfilled. And these are the days when all things must be fulfilled. All right. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you on the flip side.